Hello, Pod Smashers of the Internet, and welcome to a very, very special Christmas episode of 18-Bit Pod Smash, 18-Bit Pod Smash, where gaming goes to grab a beer and Christmas cheer. Christmas cheer. Merry uh, Christmas. Merry Christmas. We are your hosts, Penguin and Termite. I'm I am, Penguin. <laughs> I'm Termite. <laughs> and we are a weekly video game podcast smashing together ideas you care about, like, I don't know, Christmas with video games that is right and tonight we are going to dive into the topic of gift giving and generosity yeah it's a very christmas themed episode but a little bit more meta meta than some of our other christmas episodes we talked about like we used to you know our first christmas episode i'm just like reminiscing now because we've been doing this is our third christmas episode i think so yep and one year we did on just straight up Christmas and like Christmas memories. Mm-hmm. The next year, what did we do last Christmas year? Christmas in video games? Oh, like I think cri- like Christmas sales, Levels the and... effect of Christmas on the industry. So it was more of a business conversation. That was Black Friday. We just did that like three weeks ago. No, oh, didn't we? Did we? <laughs> what did we do last year then? <laughs> I thought it, it was matter. Christmas in video games. Oh, maybe you're right. Winter yes. levels. Yeah, winter, winter levels and le- like that. Yeah, yeah. that kind of stuff. And then this year we're actually, we're going to be less talking about video games, but more talking about interpersonal relationships and generosity how, and gift giving yeah gift giving and as as uh we are doing a special dlc where we're going to give each other gifts <laughs> as we a are. way to uh as a way to um include the video gaming aspect in the show but games will come up so it's cool That's right it's cool so yes that you'll have that to look forward to for our christmas episode and uh but to start we've got some news to go over no so. we have to talk about what we're drinking oh that's true you're right yes we are we're gaming goes to have a beer so cool. termite this is your beer so please I Tell think us. we drank this last year on the air on this very same episode. It's becoming a tradition. It is Hardywood's Bourbon Barrel Gingerbread Stout. I shall take a sip of it. Post Hardywood is a brewery located in Richmond, and every single year they come out with the legendary gingerbread stout, which has been coined the phrase Christmas in a bottle. I'm uh, sorry, freaking Christmas in a bottle, <laughs> uh, as I'm going to read the uh, little bottle as we do. It's our tradition, yep. right? Hardywood Gingerbread Stout, described by beer advocate as... Freegan Christmas in a Bottle. It is an imperial milk stout brewed with vanilla beans, cinnamon, fresh Casalmonte Farm baby ginger, and Bearer Farms wildflower honey. Gingerbread stout is then matured in Virginia bourbon barrels where it adapts an incredibly mellow character with oak and caramel, emerging 12 weeks later as a bourbon barrel GBS. GBS is gingerbread stout. A festive blend of spice, character, laces this rich, chocolatey stout, which warms the palate and the soul. Mm, definitely warms my soul. It is mm. a tradition. Yep. <laughs> like, I know the taste of gingerbread stout, and that's what's great about this whole series, is, like, at no point do any of the, like, bourbon barrel, Kentucky morning, like, do the new, fla- like, additional flavors compromise the original flavor. Yeah. Like, it still identifiably it- tastes gingerbread stout, which is impressive, I think. I it think really it's the is. best thing Hardywood makes, honestly. This like, specific variant of gingerbread stout? Just gingerbread stout and all the things they do with it. Okay. Like, literally, they, <laughs> like, I like Hardywood. They're interesting. They're a cool, cool place, but their beer mm. isn't so amazing that I want to go there in the middle of summer. Right. But I do want to go. I will stand in line for GBS. To get these things. It's good fun, yeah. So bourbon barrel gingerbread stout is my favorite variant of all of them. As mm-hmm. you alluded to, they have a coffee conditioned gingerbread stout. They've taken that coffee conditioned gingerbread stout and matured it in bourbon barrels. That's mm-hmm. called Kentucky Christmas Morning. That's I think my favorite. And they have like Christmas pancakes. And then there's the rum barrel aged version of this. There's a many. There's Didn't and they every do year like they come a out, like a weird like apple barrel or something like that. There's a mega GBS apple brandy. Where apple brandy. That's what it right, was. So they yeah. took apple brandy barrels and they've aged this in that. I, have I truly want to do right, like a but... tasting of mm. all of them. They to, had they had a, a case you could have pre ordered back oh, in really? September <laughs> that I didn't know of. Did, yeah. That had every single variant That's of amazing. the gingerbread stout yeah. in it. But I, I got a bottle it, so my mom gone. and I think I mentioned before that my mom and I have a tradition of drinking Bailey's yeah. on uh, Christmas morning um, with our coffee, Irish cream. Well, a couple years back I got I stood in line for the Kentucky Christmas morning. GBS, mm-hmm. and I got a bottle of that from yeah. the brewery itself, and mm-hmm. then I saved it for Christmas dinner with my parents. Yeah. And so I gave my my mom and my grandpa and my dad and myself poured a glass of that for everyone, and it was awesome. So it very much is a Christmas like thing I look forward to for Christmas every year. Yeah. It's good. I mean, it, the the beer, I mean, <laughs> we should probably talk about the actual beer itself. It is, it's very full-bodied like a stout. Um, mm-hmm. Definitely notes of like nutmeg and cinnamon and ginger. Vanilla. Vanilla, yeah. A little bit of caramel in there too. And then this bourbon version is just boozy. Yeah, it's, it has like a boozy back, boozy. back end mm-hmm. on it. Yep. Yeah, kind of caramelly too. Mm-hmm. Kind of caramel. I just said that. Oh, did you? Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> All right, so news. What's going on in the gaming's world? Uh, uh, tonight is the Game Awards. It is. And we will be live tweeting it, so you will have already experienced that by the time you listen to this episode. But so we won't bore you with any of that. We won't bore you, but we're Even are predictions are pointless at this yeah, point. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We are excited, though. So mm-hmm. uh, The biggest news that I wanted to cover was the creation of 2K's new studio called Cloud Chamber. Uh, on Twitter, they actually, uh, at Bioshock, tweeted... Yep. That 2K announced the founding of Cloud Chamber, its newest development studio. This team of storytellers has begun work on the next iteration of the acclaimed Bioshock franchise, which will be in development for the next several years. Mm-hmm. So that's pretty exciting and awesome. It is. I am always excited about Bioshock. I'm a little nervous, as always, that they're going to do something boring, like go back to Rapture instead of coming up with a whole new feel and vibe. You know, when it's been when it's been like how long the game? When the game? When did when did it, Infinite come out. That was 2012. Yeah, it sounds right. Yeah, so when it's been like coming up on 10 years since the last iteration, it's tempting to be like, well, why don't we just try to capture the success of the first one? Mm, and that's what worries me, as opposed yeah. to pushing the genre forward. But we'll see, or the um, the franchise forward. Mm. We will see, of course. But it is, uh, it's still exciting because Bioshock, of course. Yeah. The rumor I heard was that there had already been, 2K had already had a studio working on it. Mm-hmm. So this announcement would confirm that if there, if the rumor was true then that that development got shut down so they metroid primed it basically <laughs> metroid primed it kind of a little different put a little it in the hands of uh, retro studios yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. so or, or in this case they created a whole new studio for but it seems like they're starting over development they seem to indicate that it's starting development now which means it'll be in development for a few years so we'll be lucky if we get a trailer next year but who knows? It'll definitely be next gen. Yep. So that's pretty exciting. That's true. Yeah, for sure. In addition to that, there was a bunch of PlayStation games announced. Did you want to hit state the of play. highlights yeah. of that? Yeah. Uh, the state of play happened. Uh, we finally got the official reveal of Resident Evil 3 Remake. Yes. Yeah, so which exciting. looked amazing. Yeah. It looks, I mean, it's the same engine as Resident Evil 2 Remake, so it looks phenomenal. And it even has the same kind of feel over the shoulder third person that it does. The developers have were quoted in saying that it's more action oriented. But that's what Resident Evil 3 was originally. Exactly. So, that's so they're surprising. just mirroring yeah. that. Yep. That's yep. unfortunate, though. I really wish they had leaned into the horror elements. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so Resident Evil 2 is terrifying. That. Exactly. It's yeah. so good. And so Resident Evil 3 has this being called Nemesis that right, and follows they, you around the entire time. It's like which, Mr. T, right? From right. So the two. tyrant in yeah. Resident Evil 2 remake didn't exist in the original Resident Evil 2 game. Yeah. Nemesis did exist in the original Resident Evil 3 game. Yes. The remake drew inspiration from the original 3 <laughs> to put Tyrant in there that chases you around unrelentlessly. Yeah. And now... Unrelentlessly? You mean relentlessly. Relentlessly, my bad. <laughs> you can never stop him. That's it. Like He's he's always there. He chases you through every room, including yeah. the safe rooms, uh-huh. which violates Resident Evil's original paradigm mm, where you always have a yeah. safe room with yeah. different music and there's 0% chance of enemies being there. Yeah. Anyway, Resident Evil 3 is going to look like more of that, uh-huh. which is my least... Uh, your least favorite, favorite part. Like, yeah. Favorite part of Resident Evil Two <laughs> was Tyrant was fine for like a moment, but then he he's cornering he's cornering you, you when I mean, you're trying to solve puzzles like, and all, like, all the way through the entire game. Like it's not till the yeah. end of the game that right. Like yeah, spoilers. He's <laughs> spoilers. He's still there. Mm-hmm. The end of the game. I judged that by the uh, trophy list. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, I have to go to this area and kill yeah. him mm-hmm. according to the trophies. So he's going to be there at yeah. the end. Uh, what else got announced? That's um, of note. There was the Predator game, which is kind of mad. That's not Dreams. announced. That was already announced. Oh, was it? Okay. They just showed well, they new showed footage. Me. Oh, they showed the customizable uh, Predator footage and, stuff. and teased more footage at the Game Awards tonight for Ghost of Tsushima. Yes, which is awesome. And so we got an what update else? On that. What else was shown off? I feel like Resident Evil was the big one. It was because that was new. Yeah, and everyone's like, well, "What does PlayStation have left to do?" <laughs> well, that's what well they do. it's coming out in that very crowded already 2020 release date, April 2020. So that's yep. that's nuts. In oh, they fact, showed PlayStation's off. launching two, two zombie-based thriller games within a month of each other. Resident Evil 3, Resident Evil 3 and... and Last of Us Part 2. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. But different audiences for each one. Resident Evil 3 is a third-party mm-hmm. developed game. Is it? Last of Us is a single first party. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. sorry. Well, Resident Evil 3 will come out on Xbox. Yeah. Last it, of Us It's interesting not. that Capcom is trying to compete in that space, though, with... Right. And they may not be directly competing, but they are kind of competing. Yeah. So there are people there are people out there who will say, I can only afford to buy Last of Us or Resident Evil. Which one am I gonna get? And we'll probably get Last of Us. Yeah, everyone will will say Last yeah, of Us. Who exactly. has a PlayStation? So we'll So see. there was also um Babylon's Fall, which was yes, announced. That's what I wanted yeah. to that's the other one. Yeah. Was Platinum about. Games developed it, Square Enix is publishing it. They I am showed becoming it just such some... a huge fan yeah. of Platinum Games. They're so awesome. I will probably want to pick that one Did up. Did you watch the trailer? Later. It looks so fun. It looks awesome. It looks like Devil Dark Souls mixed with Devil May Cry, yeah. like it's got the it's got the vibe of like the Knights in Armor of Dark Souls, yep. but the 
ease of combat of a Devil May Cry game. So, and it looks I'm like sorry. it has the color pa- palette of Nier Automata. Oh, yeah. If you mm-hmm. noticed, it just looked mm-hmm. like... Yeah, Nier is such a good game, too, yeah. man. And that's the same team. And that's Platinum, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So Platinum yep. is becoming, like, now... They are now the ARPG hack and slash kings. Yeah, they like, are. Capcom has kind of lost that crown, and now it's passed on to Platinum. That's all they make. It's mm-hmm. good. We should do a developer profile on them. How about that? <laughs> all right. Uh, is that all for that's news? It. That's all cool. we're talking yep. about. There's more, but... We'll, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm with you on that. That's it. Let's move on to... <gasps> we, wish we wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. We're skipping favorite things we tonight are, because, because we have presents to unwrap. are our favorite things. Yes. You, our listeners, are our favorite things today. And we wish y'all Merry Christmas. Thank you for staying with us all year long. Yeah. Another year has passed. Uh-huh. And we do it for you, the exactly. audience. Yes, we do. And so we our do favorite thing a is a you. Selfish. We like it. Well, you know. We dig it. <laughs> yes. It gives me creative joy. Mm-hmm. But yes, we did want to get to our gift exchange. We wanted to do our own little Christmas celebration. So we were just going to do a nice sentimental sappy favorite thing, saying y'all are our favorite things. We hope you have a Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Woo! So that leads us into DLC. DLC. Downloadable content. Downloadable content is normally a conversation that you wouldn't normally have about video games. Today, it is just going to be we got games for each other and we're going to exchange them. A conversation we have never had with video games. Yeah, a conversation of exchanging them. We have buying them for each other. In advance, prior to this, we had set up that we were going to buy each other games mm-hmm. or game, yep. depending on what our, our budget was or yep. however you want to work we it. We set a for each limit other. of, what did we say, 60 bucks was the normal yep. price of a of single game, game. Yep. but we agreed that if we could, in the budget, purchase two games for mm-hmm. that for under that price, that we would. Conveniently, Black Friday happened between then our yep. agreement. Um, but we did both say no more than two. Right. So we didn't want like a stack of games being right. bought for each other. And the other person only got one game. <laughs> Jedi right. Fall in order for the other. You know what yeah. I mean? So um, two games was the limit, the numerical limit, but the monetized limit was just 60 bucks. So we mm-hmm. said like, what do you say? 20 and 60 or something like that? I don't remember yeah. what the price point was. That's something matter. like that. To set the stage, Termite got a little Christmas tree from his desk that's got lights mm-hmm. and everything. It's probably eight inches. No, Completely it's, it's undecorated like a, a other than the little white lights on it, but it yep. doesn't matter. It's a little tree yep. sitting on our desk and beneath it we have two presents. Termite's present is immaculately wrapped. Beautifully, wonderfully wrapped with a little ribbon tied on you it. You said that wrong. The gift I bought for yeah, you. Yes, sorry. Termite's gift that he bought to give me. Yes. Yes, yep. my yep. gift. Yes. No, 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 that's a weird. That's a yeah, weird. Yeah, you said dichotomy. termite's gift. No, sorry. Yes, but Term- it's not my the gift. The gift that termite got for penguin yes. is immaculate, and beautifully wrapped. Termite, I want you to describe the wrapping job that penguin did for you. <laughs> Very much on brand for Penguin Man. Uh, he re-gifted some wrapping paper from a baby shower, so it has. Hello. <laughs> You know, baby things on it. Just and you, then, my baby. Uh, it's not baby. folded nicely at all. It's balled up into a giant, <laughs> massive mess uh, and, with wrapped uh, painter's tape around it <laughs> to keep it together. Hey, but I got so, a little bow on there for you. And that was uh, that was disconnected. That's not even attached. The <laughs> bow is the bow <laughs> is just laying on it. It's not even. It's it's like not sticky. So the bow was just a extra. You pulled it out of your bag separately and just threw it on top of the present. And no, it was it taped is. on there originally. It just fell off while oh, in my bag while being transported. A likely in my bag. story. Beautiful. So yeah, very much on brand for penguin to uh, and very much on brand for termite to not wrap try. It, so. Is that is that how we? No, do? you. I want you to know. I tried very yeah, hard talk about to this. wrap this as terribly as possible. I put oh. more effort into <laughs> wrapping this terribly than I put into wrapping someone else's gift immaculately. Oh, like a friend of ours. It took more work to make it look like that. Then it, yes, it did. <laughs> how? It looks like you just threw it into a. Trash can and I had pulled to out find the whole materials. bag. I had to pick out the right bad materials for it. You know what I mean? Like, like <laughs> all the Christmas stuff was already out and ready, but I had to go searching I mean, like, for what the is painter's this tape. Mess? <laughs> like, I think I, I just remodeled my basement and it looks better than this. All right, all right. How do you want to do the this? Trash I think that. the way we should do this is we each open the gifts one at a time. So I can go first, for example, or you can go first, doesn't matter, or we can flip But I have one ball of mess, and you have two right, you open, presents. open it up, I don't and know how, then okay. we explain, so then the other person who's, who's, who's giving the gift then will explain why they got it for them, for the other person, and uh-huh. the person receiving it explains why they're excited. 
Okay. I get it. Make sense? Yes. All right. So, who do you want to go first? You go first. All right. I'll go first. So, I'm a rap. You're, I'm you're very eager. I am very eager. And of course, so I can be- already tell based on what I am seeing here that one of the games is smaller than the other, which would lead me to assume that one of them is a Nintendo Switch game, mm-hmm. which is very exciting. Yeah, these are not disguised. All right. I am. Um, oh, you're going for the Switch rapping. game first. I am. I want to know. I'm curious. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Bloodstained Ritual of the Night. Ooh. Ooh. I did not expect to get this game. It was a late addition to my yeah, wish list. it was. But um, very exciting. I'm excited. I picked it up that game for you uh-huh. because it's not one of the mainstream triple A like cash in titles. Yeah, yeah. It's something a little more niche, but it was on your list. So I knew you wanted it. Uh, it did not have a priority. So I knew it was medium. medium yep. And I was like, okay with that. I wasn't going to get yeah, anything low yeah, yeah, or yeah. lower, lowest. But so it was not super expensive. And I tacked it on there as a. An extra like icing on the cake. That's why I'm glad that you went for it first. Yeah, that's, so, it's good. I, I'm I. It was a late addition to my to my thing. But I, after talking on our vampire episode, I was really craving our Halloween episode this year. We talked about vampires. Yep. I was really craving like a Castlevania style game, and I've heard a lot of good things about Bloodstain. Yep. So I'm. It's been a while since I've really dug into a platformer. So I'm actually very intrigued. So I'm excited that I've more or less finished. Uh, Pokemon so that I can dig into that as my next Switch game. Hold on, I gotta wrap, unwrap this one okay. so you can also explain it. Yep. Next, all right. So uh, your second Second game. gift. This one's obviously PlayStation 4 because it is. What if it's a oh, DVD? <gasps> oh, what is it? Control! Ah, this is what I wanted! <laughs> that is the game that you wanted the most. This is the game definitely was on, especially since... Oh, you know the game awards it's it's been it's, one, it's a nomination really for well game of the nominated. year yep i am so i honestly didn't expect this really and part of the reason why is because i thought the best deal for this game was the black friday target deal where That's you exactly get it for where 25 I got it. bucks yep but you got it before black friday or did you get this before black friday no i got control on black friday the day of no, actually, I got it on Thanksgiving did Day. Did you get this one before then? I did. Oh, yeah. see, you threw me off. Yes. I'm well good at that. Done. I'm good at that. That's exciting. Someone... I got control on Black Friday as well for a friend. Oh, so nice. So it's kind of fun to kind of like, oh, cool. Now I kind of also got it for myself. I got it back. Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you. I'm very excited. Well, do you want to explain why you got me control? Because someone told me that was your most wanted game for Christmas on your list. Okay, cool. Who told you, can, you that? You can probably figure that out. My wife? Nope. Oh, well. Okay, go ahead and unwrap yours. I knew you wanted it really badly. That's why I, I got it I did want it really badly. I'm very excited. <laughs> so this is a mess. I'm just going to tear into it. Yep. Get it. Get it. Oh, now we have um, packaging <laughs> plastic and rubber bands. Rubber bands. I'm so glad you can't actually see the like, game. You that. actually really... went through a dumpster for me. Thank you. <laughs> I did. I did. <laughs> it's a bag. <laughs> bag is so just... this is a massive plastic bag. <laughs> It's kind of like I gave you games in a trash bag. You did. You, you, these are games <laughs> in a trash bag. <laughs> What'd you get? What'd you, you pluralized get? games before I actually saw oh, and confirmed snap. that there was two. Just oh, letting you man. know you did that. I think I've done that like three times tonight. There's two so. bags. <laughs> and I'm not looking at them in my lap because these are clear see-through plastic bags. Oh, I, I don't want to know what they are until I have them in my hand. Outside da, 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 da. of there, what is this? Those are gift receipts in case you want to return them. Oh, yeah, okay. see, let's put that face down. Just in case, right you know, I always like to include the gift receipt just in case you're, you're like, oh, that's so you're good. And then you're, I right, got it right, for you. Right. That's it. That's all you get. <laughs> all right, what we got? We have medieval. Yes. yes. Okay, and really quick, I yeah. want you to know that is a brand new copy, but yeah. it was the one that I told you was a display copy. Yeah. And I tried. I went to multiple Game Stops. I oh, called dang. multiple Game Stops to you see if they had yeah. an unsealed version, and no like one had an unsealed actual, version. You yeah. mean a sealed version? Or oh, sorry, a sealed version. Yeah. So, dang. but they did put it in a little plastic for yeah. me. So, yep. yeah. All right. So okay. medieval. I want you. So I got medieval for you because I. So I looked through your list and I talked to your brother, and I know that like your brother and your family were intending to get you games that were on your quote highest. So I was oh. shooting for a lower priority, Spoiler but alert. I also kind of, yeah, but I also kind of wanted to get you something that I, I researched the trophies, okay? Is that what this was? Super easy trophy. This is going to be like a cakewalk for you. So it's a platinum. It is a, it is an easy, it was listed as an easy platinum and very Ooh. short, like nine to 10 hour platinum. Uh, it's right one there. thing to get me a video game for Christmas that you know I want to play because it's on my wish list. Uh, it's a whole nother layer of love. <laughs> to get exactly. me a platinum trophy for Christmas. Yes, I'm getting you exactly. Because that's essentially well, you still have what to you work did here. for. It. Well, you yeah, still have to yeah, work for it, but, but it was yeah. an easy one. The next game, do you want to? Have you already looked at it? I have not. Oh, then pull it up. 
Metro Exodus! Yes! That one I got for you for similar reasons, in the sense that it was medium on your list. Yeah. And then also, it was, I researched the Platinum. It's a little bit longer and more involved than Medieval. So it's mm-hmm. more like a 50 to 60 hour Platinum. Yeah. But it still doesn't require any hard modes or anything like that. So it should That's be, amazing. it should be pretty, both of these should be pretty easy Platinums for you to ultimately get. And both games are games that I also kind of want to borrow. I didn't uh, want that to be my primary motivating factor, but. Yeah. I was pleased because I'm like, I will totally borrow those games at some point. Yes. <laughs> so, do you like them? I love them. Great. Thank you so much. Yes. And I have uh, the Metro 1 and 2 Redux. Yes. The remastered versions digitally. And I've been dying to play this too. And I can't tell you how many times I have almost impulse bought this. Mm-hmm. So thank you. Well, I have. I found great. They were on really good deals on Black Friday. And I also traded some games to make it even better for Ooh. me. So that was fun. The whole thing was very, very good. You I probably spent more on the trash bags <laughs> that they came in. <laughs> I have actually no idea what those bags are for. So They're packaging bags. Well, that's bit. our DLC for the day. I hope you listeners enjoyed it, and I hope you are inspired to get games for each other. Um, it's fun to... It is super fun. It's fun to give gifts. It's also fun to receive gifts. So. <laughs> My brother and I always get presents for each other every year, and we didn't really plan it or like dictate that it has to be video games, mm-hmm. but it essentially is we get each other games every year, and yeah. it's awesome. Nice. So I'm glad that we were able to do this. Do you prefer... Here's a, here's a question. Here's yeah. a question to sort of set the stage, because yeah. we're about to jump into our main topic. Okay. Do you prefer to give gifts or to receive gifts? Like, be, you're being honest, 100% mm-hmm. honest. What's more exciting, to get a good gift or to give a good gift? Mm. And has that changed? It's possible that's changed over the years, because I know people who... Okay, I'll start because I I've always been I love getting gifts. I right. love getting good like when like I just it's uh, still I'm, I get excited around Christmas, mm-hmm. and I still also feel that like disappointment when I didn't get what I wanted. Yeah, <laughs> what I wanted. Mm-hmm. Um, I got what I wanted. I'm happy yeah. by the way. <laughs> but like you know that disappointment every Christmas where it's like oh man it's not exactly what I was hoping for. So um I do I do love getting gifts. I've grown in my appreciation for giving gifts over time, mm-hmm. but I don't think that joy of giving has surpassed. The joy of receiving yet. I think the big thing that's going to change is as my son gets older. Yep. I think that's when I'm going to be like digging the whole like, I'm going to surprise the crap out of this That's kid. why I couldn't answer right away. I was like, wait a minute. I have likewise been extremely excited to receive presents, gifts all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have grown in such a way that I really, really, really love experiences yes. more than I ever have. Yeah. And I'm finding that increasing more than mm-hmm. I expected. Uh, giving gifts has been amazing mm-hmm. for, I have two kids now. Yeah. Obviously the baby who's five months old is not going to know that right. I got him a gift, right. but my four year old will yes. <laughs> and loves opening stuff. Yeah. And so it's super, super exciting and fun to give a gift as mm-hmm. well. So if I had to put it, you know, one or the other, I would almost say it's 50 50. Okay. All right. It's like 50 50 split. But do you think it's getting like it's starting to the gap is closing and it may be surpassed? At As some point? I go towards the experience yeah. more than the gifts themselves, uh, I think, yeah, it would, it'll start giving gifts will be yeah. more of a, I'll be more excited to give the physical, tangible mm-hmm. gifts. Because like I was extremely excited about your birthday when oh, we did the, yeah, yeah. the whole day going to Richmond and do I was ridiculously excited about <laughs> doing that for you and yeah. going to Jack Brown's and all that stuff. So I think that excitement to give you that yeah would have far surpassed the excitement of buying you any more games. Well, that's exciting about the the fun thing about games is when you actually look at them. Like yes, they are technically stuff, so you are receiving mm-hmm. an item. But there's also the the fact that you are also giving someone an experience. Yep. They're going to experience You're that giving game. me a platinum trophy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I can't ask for more. Yeah. That's amazing. And you're going to experience all the artistic... That's a Cupid bow of heart straight to my <laughs> love. I swift, swift, and swift medieval, that. you should be able to play in front of your kids. It's goofy and cartoony exactly, enough, I yeah. imagine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I was thinking about perfect. that, too. So. Same game. It's funny. We both got each other kind of Halloween-y style games. Yeah, we did. <laughs> Just fun. Medieval and Bloodstained. So, yeah. Well, cool. Um, so, okay, let's jump into this main topic. So yes. we're talking about gift giving and then we're also going to be talking about generosity but let's lean in on gift giving first yep gift giving is obviously a christmas tradition in the west and so i wanted to first talk about why do we have this tradition why do we give each other gifts um, so on the christmas holiday you challenged me to do some research and come prepared i did i actually challenged you to reflect <laughs> that too <laughs> but you actually did research that i i did intended obviously because i wrote this question down <laughs> yeah it's nominal if you ask any person on the street if you just walk down the street with a microphone and you approach a stranger and say, why do we give gifts on Christmas? Mm -hmm. I would assume 90% of your answers would be because the three wise men gave gifts to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And we just have that. Yeah. That's actually not the reason why. I I wouldn't have believed it for a second. (laughs) Right. And so what would you have said if you had done no research 
someone just came up to you on a whim and said, hey, why don't we give gifts on Christmas? Because I would have said three wise men. Yeah. Oh, oh, if I'm doing no research. Right. Like at, at like, ever, any point in my life. Like two weeks ago, if someone would have said, why don't we give gifts uh, to Two weeks ago, Christmas? I would have known. It's probably, I would have said it's probably in, involving like one of the, like the pagan traditions. A That's lot of exactly the stuff. Yeah, it. I was going to say a lot of the stuff from Christmas, the tree. Right. Well, yeah. See, like I knew all mm-hmm. the traditions around Christmas were yeah. all stolen from different types of mm-hmm. things. Like even the Catholics hated the trees because the trees mm-hmm. came from the Germanic land. Yeah, like, the early church would have never gotten like material gifts for right. each other because their whole thing was like just pool all of your resources together and live together. <laughs> you know what I right. mean? Like live live as one. Yeah. So I don't think that that would have like the wise men thing would have been a part of it. Right. So um, I would have suspected it would have been like European like winter solstice festivals happened around the winter solstice which is would be the 21st 20th or 21st of every year and mm. so the church kind of co-opted that and said this is now a holiday about jesus's birth right that's, that's <laughs> and how it took that all happened, the yeah. traditions and we're like they're now about jesus mm-hmm. <laughs> so but i would assume i don't know the specifics but i would assume but you probably do so because you well, have we'll walk you thing. through the next step of that yeah, question yeah, okay. okay next step is okay i was wrong about the wise men so they would have told me you're wrong yeah. about the wise men termite what's the next reason why why do you think people give gifts on christmas then i would have thought for a minute and been like in the west capitalism that's why <laughs> yeah that's actually i mean it's true but not not the actual reason right. we give gifts on it's christmas it's sort of been like it's like facilitated by cap it's like capitalism jumped on that and was like it, let's yep. make an industry out of this <laughs> yeah but you're right you're also right the cynical and the <laughs> yeah and the tra- quote, traditional uh-huh. are both wrong answering that wrong or sorry both answers are wrong in that case. So, what's the real answer? The real answer is back in the 1800s, particularly in New York City, this this broader transformation of Christmas was a time of public revelry. Mm-hmm. And at that time, I'm going to try and paraphrase. I have a lot of notes here. But at that time, between 1800 and 1850, uh, there were elites, like the rich people. They mm-hmm. became increasingly frightened of traditional December rituals of this social inversion, which poor people could demand food and drink from wealthy and celebrate in the streets, abandoning the established social constraints, much like Halloween night or New Year's Eve, these rituals which occurred any time between St. Nicholas Day, which was a Catholic feast day on December 6th, through New Year's Day, that the the peasants or even American slaves discontent during the traditional downtime of an agricultural cycle because it's wintertime, right? They're not farming. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so they, they would go to the streets and they would start begging and they would like ask for the And so the elites thought of this as a nuisance. It's annoying. Uh, and then you have like New York City starting as a newly congested like urban environment. So you have these aristocrats that are worried about these celebrations becoming vehicles for, for protest even. So like, okay, now that all of these deplorables if you will are like gathering and begging and having this revelry time in the downtime they're not working and so like that's a breeding ground for a protest we don't want that so employers refused to give workers time off as well so there was some a little bit of oppression uh long winters of unemployment loomed for seasonal laborers i mean it was all this stuff happening in the culture in those early 1800s so these this group of people called the knickerbockers (laughs) can't not make this up like this happened Invented a new series of traditions. That'd be a great podcast name, by the Wouldn't way. It? Yeah. <laughs> For this time of year that gradually moved Christmas celebrations out of the city streets and into the homes of people, like in New York. Interesting. They yeah. presented these traditions as a reinvigoration of Dutch customs practiced in New Amsterdam and New York during the colonial period. And although this Nissenbaum and other scholars, part of the Knickerbockers, have established that these supposed anti ant- ant- ten antecedents i don't even know what that word means like, without seeing it i wouldn't know yeah Doesn't matter. go on yep largely did not exist in north america drawing from two-story collections by washington irving their most well-known member these new yorkers experimented with domestic festivities on saint nicholas day and new year's day until another member of the group named clement clark moore solidified the tradition of celebrating on christmas with his enormously popular poem a night before Christmas. Oh, wow. So the culture... That's interesting. That would have been around the time. So 1800s as well. Like mm-hmm. Christmas as a tradition was dying. Like people didn't celebrate Christmas. It was seen as like like the Jewish Yom Kippur. Right. Where it's like people were like, okay, some really diehard Christians are going to celebrate it, but no one really cares mm-hmm. about Christmas anymore. And then Charles Dickens wrote The Christmas Carol. Yep. And it sold like hotcakes. People fly, flew off the shelf because he was already a really popular mm-hmm. novelist at the time. When was that? Do you and know? People, it was sometime in the 1800s. I don't know if it was before or after this. That's what I was wondering if it was the same time frame. I think it might have been around. It was around the same time frame because I know the, the two, 
the two works are published around the same time. Mm-hmm. So I'm not quite sure exactly, but I do know that like it kind of reinvigorated the English. Because again, this is all English to like right. England. Well, I said New York. Well, yeah, yeah, but yeah. People... England and America. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So people, were, but you know, Dickens, you know, America existed by the time Dickens was writing. So like, yeah, it's a, uh, it's interesting how Christmas as a history has kind of ebbed. It's not always been this ubiquitously huge holiday like it right. is now. It it's organically kind of, kind of formed yeah. from the streets, yep. or at least the elites and the it's aristocrats. History is fascinating. Yeah. So, so they, there's more to this article. It's an Atlantic article. I'll link off to it in the notes. But they talk about how you know moving the celebrations from the streets into their homes. And so these revelries, these parties became family things. And yeah. then the gift exchanges were a way to appease the children, to keep them in their homes, to mm. like homemade gifts, homemade toys. <laughs> Don't like, worry, kids. We're not going out and getting drunk in the street. Instead, we're going to stay gonna home. Stuff, we're yeah. going to protect you from and toys. And, so yeah. there was, there, and then the emergence of the middle class was also in there, too, for the first time ever in the United States. I mean, I don't even know how, how it was in Europe, but yeah. I know in America, the emergence of that middle class, like not elites, yeah. not poor, but still like, okay. Yeah. They were the ones that were really pushing for the, the home in, yeah. in their house because they didn't want their kids exposed to either, yeah. either side. Yeah. They didn't want the elitists or the poor people. Yep. Uh, it's so it's fascinating to yeah, see it like a really interesting holiday and interesting to see where our tra- traditions come from. There's a great quote, by the way, because we're going to be saying tradition a lot. Tradition. One of my favorite quotes about tradition I've seen recently is yeah. tradition is just peer pressure from dead people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We have to do it. It's fair. Yeah. We have to do it. We have to do it. That's the way we've always done it. Why like, not? Grandma's in her grave. She's yeah, going to stir. It's so mad if you don't do it. Yeah. Cool. So um, that's the tradition that's of gift giving. Gift giving. That's awesome. Uh, I'm glad you did that research. Yep. Um, so. We know gift giving exists. What are different strategies that people that you've noticed people, you know, use to manage the idea of holiday gifting? Because the idea of just outright just getting buying stuff for everybody in your family and friends is impractical for most of us in the middle class, (laughs) the aforementioned middle class. So what are different strategies that you've noticed people? I do do want to talk about the un un what's the word for like capping something or limiting something? You're looking for the unlimited what you just mentioned. Yeah, yeah, Like, yeah. not restricting yourself at all. Like, yeah. the full-blown gift giving. Yeah. Like, I'm going to buy a list of things for everyone in the family. Mm-hmm. That is extremely dangerous. It is extremely dangerous. So, I didn't yeah. even think about the different strategies that we employ. There's also, like, social things, too, because someone who does that and then people don't, like, there's a social pressure around gift giving as well, where yep. it's like, well, but I didn't get you an iPod Nano, so, like... Now I feel like a jerk. So there's yep. definitely some like social and I oh my really, gosh. as we'll talk about with Jen, as we'll get further into the conversation, I do wish that's something we could let go of as a culture because it undercuts the entire point yep. of gift giving. Right. But still, and like, this reminds is, me, it still exists. Like it's still worth noting because it still is a, a, a thing. But. Have you seen the movie Four Christmases? No. The, pre- uh, the premise yeah. of the movie is like a couple that gets together and yeah, each of them have the... divorced parents mm-hmm. so they have to go through four families to go see everyone. Yeah. And so the one that you just mentioned, this guy is super rich. He's from the city mm-hmm. and he gives this kid who is uh, like a cousin. I don't even know how it's related to him. Uh, an Xbox 360. Oh my gosh. And the kid opens it up and he's extremely excited. He immediately looks at his dad and says, why didn't you get me an Xbox? And then he runs off screaming and crying because all mm-hmm. he got was a flashlight from his extremely impoverished father. Yeah. And like that just completely shows yeah, what well, we're talking about the, here. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, they're the doing whole, it to be I've funny. Seen the but... whole, like, I've seen the whole um, the idea of like you shouldn't tell your kids that the like most expensive present you got was from Santa. Right. Because then they're going to go to school and tell their potentially poorer friends that they got an xbox for christmas right and the kid's gonna be like but from santa uh-huh and then the kid's gonna be like why didn't santa get me why did santa only get me oh, a there's coloring so book? much like there's so much social. societal and social yeah. exactly it's nuts hmm. so but i didn't want to talk about some of these strategies because yeah. there's a yeah, bunch and we can talk about we pros and so cons of as each. a way to avoid those cons we yes. have come up with strategies there's as a, a whole society. bunch of strategies yeah, yeah so the first listed. one is a simple idea that we've even employed in ours which is spending limits yep you all agree and say, spend no more than this amount of money. Yep. And that could be anything from $5 at like your church's, you know, small group, like just get together, exchange gifts for fun, mm-hmm. spending limit at $5. Or it could be within your family. Hey, let's keep the spending limit down to 60 so nobody feels like they're just, you know, yep. super poor. And so it's a, the pro is like nobody feels like they can't afford to get a good gift in return yep. for people. The con is nobody ends up getting really nice gifts and nobody has the opportunity to give someone to lavish an extravagant right. gift on someone. Yeah, it does kind of put a cap on like what do you really want as a, as a gift giver if you're looking yeah. at who you're buying for, you want to get them a good gift mm-hmm. and that may or may not exceed the price limit. Right. And if it does, 
then that kind of stinks because you're not if you're coming from a, a place of good intentions where you don't want truly yeah you're not trying to show off or like no. be lavish you're you, you just genuinely, you care about the person and you want right, them to get something that, that's that nice, spending yeah. limit get, would be kind of like crap now i have to go and downgrade you to something that i know right. i don't know if you want or maybe you don't want and, you're and we're gonna, not trying to cast aspersions and say that one of these any one of these strategies is better or worse than the right. others it really is just like it's it's up to you and your family and your interpersonal relationships mm-hmm. to decide. And it depends on where this happens. Yeah, because exactly. this kind of spending limit happens at our work. Gift it always exchange. makes me think of the like the office episode where he gets an iPod yeah, or whatever yeah, and everyone what, else yeah, gets like yeah. T- yeah, yeah. Yep. <laughs> and <laughs> that's exactly like that episode is highlighting this as well. Mm-hmm. And so spending limits are great in the context of like church groups or work employee mm-hmm. groups so no or, one just or gets even friend crazy. groups. Yep. Like mm-hmm. it'd be great if all of our friends got together. It was like spending limit 10 bucks. Something hilarious. And spending limit if you, again, I would say that you should use, you should use the strategy if you are the kind of person who does feel guilty, like who's predisposed towards like, if that would, if it would damage your relationship with someone to like get something less than them or get something more than them. Yeah. Then you should absolutely employ the strategy because Mm -hmm. like you should never put gift giving over the, you should never get the joy of giving or receiving over your actual relationships yeah, themselves. Because yeah. that's the whole point. Gift giving right. should be augmentative to relationships, right. not. So, yeah. Yep. So that's one strategy. Uh, number Another strategy is the idea of secret Santa. Again, Those a lot fun. of these usually also come included with a spending limit. But the idea of secret Santa is just like everyone throws their names into a hat and then or, or, or some other form of randomization. Yep. And you pull someone's name out of the hat and that's who you are supposed to get a gift for. Yep. And then someone else, and but you're not supposed to tell them who you are. Right. So it's the idea of, so you get a gift, and you give a gift, and... Then when you all get together, it's you have a pile of gifts under the tree with yeah. name tags on them, and you don't know who bought what. Yes. You just see who they're for. Exactly. Yeah. And, and then, it's kind of fun. And then there's a later kind of like, oh, who got this for me? Yeah. I did. Oh, it's super cute. So what right. are the pros and cons of Secret Santa? The pros are it's ridiculously fun. You have no <laughs> idea who got it. So I like the idea of a Secret Santa, because it mm-hmm. kind of does santify for adults. Yeah. Santify the gift. Where you, you genuinely have no idea who got that for you. Mm-hmm. It's fun to shop for someone when they know, when, when you're thinking they're not going to know who you are. So it employs, it immediately, uh, it evokes this idea of strategy and planning mm-hmm. of like, what am I going to get this well, person? Well, and also it's a test of how well do you know this person, you yeah. know what I mean? Which can also be a con. Right. That can also be a con. Like, yeah. oh crap, I got this person. I don't know anything about them and I have no idea how to figure out how to get them something. You know what yep. I mean? Because then you have to like talk to their friends and be like, what is, what is this person like? I don't even know them. Yeah. So it is a, it is both a really, it can be both a really good thing and a really scary thing in like a workplace scenario. The you know what I mean? The biggest pro is if you have a big family get together, like mm-hmm. we're going to have with my wife's family. Instead of everyone buying gifts for everyone, this is the best way that everyone gets a gift. Mm-hmm. So the event includes everyone. Yeah. It's not exclusive. And you put it, it has a major implication of a spending limit because you're buying one gift yeah. for one person. So you have a group of 20 people. If everyone bought a gift for all 19 other people, yes. everyone's opening 19 presents. It's insane. And it's and an extremely insane expensive. amount of money. Yeah, right. Exactly. And so yeah. this, this implies like, has an inherent money yeah. spending limit mm-hmm. on it, even if you don't have one. Like if yeah. you don't, if you don't, put and it is really on. good for family too, because ideally you know those people well enough right. to know what they like. Yep. I so mean, and there's always, favorite. there's I also always the like Santa's. potential that you you don't. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, especially new additions to the family in regards to like marriages, spouses. Yeah, kids. Always awkward. Like that first first year of marriage, Secret Santa with your spouses with your in laws. Yeah, you're like, it's uh, like uh, I don't know any of you enough to know what. And you you're hoping want. your spouse has fed them enough information <laughs> about you to like make that up. Yep. Well, cool. Uh, Secret, so Secret Santa's got pros and cons. White Elephant, again, similar. Oh, sorry, sorry. Another con, really quick, with Secret uh, Santa. Yeah. Just a simple con is like, at the end of the day, though, you get less presents. You only get one thing. Well, that's fine. That might I, be yeah. a, that might be Could a pro be a for some people. Yeah. I can also, I also know it's a con because like, again, and we'll talk about our go-tos and everything, but with my family, we all, again, it was just the core, the nuclear family, my yeah. two sisters and my parents, we uh-huh. all got gifts for each other. Yeah. So you still end up getting like five or six gifts uh-huh. at the end of the day. So only doing like one gift, which is what we would do with my wife's family, is like mm-hmm. it's always kind of disappointing her because she's like, ah, I only got one gift. Again, there is an economy to that yep. that some people value over others, and I can say for myself, I know it sounds selfish. It is always kind of disappointing to walk away being like, ah, oh, I only got one gift. I don't feel that at all. That's, That's fine. fine. Yep, it's a difference in personality, huh. right? Yeah, there. it yep. is. I don't think it's a again good or positive thing. Maybe some yeah. people will, will listen to this and be like, God, penguins, jerk, <laughs> 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 so so greedy, wants gifts. <laughs> But like it's just it's part of the tradition for me. It was right. always like, oh yeah, I always always get a handful of gifts. Mm-hmm. I appreciate that about the holiday. Yeah. Whatever, it's fine. Cool. White elephants we were talking about. So similar to Secret Santa, except the idea is like 
everyone buys kind of a gag gift or like, a, again, super, there's usually a spending limit, like don't get more than five or 10 bucks. Mm-hmm. The idea is everything under the tree is questionably desirable. I think it's probably yep. the best way to describe it. Yeah. And you take turns and there's usually, it's also, it's also been referred to as Thieves Christmas. I've heard the term mm-hmm. Thieves Christmas, White Elephant, whatever you call it. The idea is that like, there's different rules each time, but it usually involves something along the lines of like, Someone can choose to either open a gift or take a gift that's already been opened, but you can only take a gift a certain amount of time. There's a limit yep. to the amount House of times. Rules. Yeah. yeah. And so the idea is that like everything is like, oh, that's kind of cool. That's a like a Star Wars mug set. I'd like that Star Wars mug set. I'm going to take that. And then the person then can choose to either take something else or get the gift under the tree. But the idea is like there's all these random things out there that people might like mm-hmm. or might not like. Right. And you don't know what you're going to get when you unwrap something. Mm-hmm. So therefore, you have an opportunity to like choose something that you do know has been unwrapped and mm-hmm. therefore can get they're fun the pros are exactly that like it's frivolous it's more just meant to you take the entire stress out of the gift giving and buying process you're buying for the group instead of an individual exactly everybody knows that what they're getting or what they're what they're getting is going to be just kind of meh Mm -hmm. so there's no pressure of like oh i have to get the best thing yeah for this person you don't have to buy for a specific person like you Mm -hmm. said you're buying for the group quote unquote what would the group think is fun or funny right or, or cool yep um and then the cons are it's usually junk. <laughs> right. <laughs> Most of the time, you're not going to get something that you're going to be like, this is amazing. I use this every day. Mm. There, there are, are some, there things, are some but... people who are smart enough within the spending limit to get something that you would love. Yeah. And then yeah. you try to get it. And the harder you try to get something, the you're the least likely you are to get it. Because it's usually appealing to more someone than just you. Yeah. And then they steal it. And then there's X amount of times limits on the stealing. And then it's locked, quote unquote locked. Yeah. That person has it. And that's it. And so you could walk away with something you absolutely have no connection to yeah, at all. Exactly. It's compl- like you just walk away and throw it in the trash. Yep. Mm-hmm. Like I've almost done that. But there are that. some things that I have that are that are from White Elephant gifts that I love. So for mm-hmm. example, I got a, a a a coffee mug that's shaped like Kylo Ren's helmet from yeah, Force Awakens. That. I yep. love it. I drink it every every like every time it's available. Like coffee and that. Yeah. I'll take my coffee like I take my dark side. Dark. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the cool part is with this kind of gift giving exchange you could theme it so you can mm-hmm. be like this is a Game of Thrones white elephant everything yeah. under the tree has to be Game of Thrones and mm-hmm. you know your friend group loves it so or your coworkers or whoever you're playing with so you could make it so where every gift under the tree really is desirable yeah. mm-hmm. but most of the time I've never experienced one of those by the way I wish uh, I would yeah. have uh-huh. uh, most of the time it's just like spending limit $10 and it's all garbage yeah. and there's one thing it's like eh, of all the things here this is kind of cool yeah. and then you never get it yeah. and you're stuck with <laughs> something you just throw in the trash yep yep yeah white elephants are, are a mixed bag i think i think this is perfect for co-workers yes this is a perfect work yeah exchange we do one every year at work and i love it yeah because usually people are witty enough to make most of the gifts kind of fun yeah you get yeah. you get the gift cards chocolate level of fun and then you get like the ridiculous gag gift yeah. desk game yeah this like, is great for like small groups things yeah. where you kind of know people but you don't know them really well yep. so it is just kind of like let's do some things a like, gag gifts let's make everybody laugh mm-hmm. so it's more about the experience of the get together everyone getting together and laughing about the presents as yeah. opposed to what's actually good mm-hmm. um another strategy that we use in my family actually is wish list shopping which is just and what's actually kind of what we did tonight, too, which is just Kinda, like, yeah. I'm giving you a wish list. So there's still the element of surprise. I don't know. I know I'm getting things within a range, but I don't know which of these things you're going to get me. Yeah. And it gives you the option, takes the pressure out of like, you have to get me the perfect gift. I'm telling you what I want. And when I get it, I'm like, sweet. I don't know which of these things I'm going to get. So there's a, there's a balance. It's not 100% like, oh, wow, you've put so much thought and effort into it. But it is it is. Gift giving for the person for the family or person who is not intuitive mm-hmm. an intuitive gift giver. If that you, makes you sense, you call this utilitarian. Very utilitarian. Yeah, it's yes. like <laughs> here's what I want. Go get these things for me. You know, okay. Yeah. Here's what do you want? Okay, cool. I'll go shop for you. Yep. And then that's it. You spend however much money you want. Yep. And here's all the things on your wish list. Yep. Exactly. Uh, you can sometimes get blown away. Right. By the, mm. I put like a PlayStation Vita on my list, which is three hundred dollars right now because they don't make them anymore. And if you find a new one, it's rare and hard. So I, if someone came to me with a brand new PlayStation Vita, I would be floored, yeah. and I would almost not take it and be like return this. This is extremely extravagant. This is crazy. But like that's on my wish list. Yeah, we did right? it for my friend Aaron for his bachelor party. Uh-huh. He just got married. We talked about this in the last episode. Um, he just got married. He put on his wish list a giant six hundred dollar Millennium Falcon Lego set, yes. not expecting anyone to get it for him. Just uh-huh. as kind of a joke for people to scroll through and be like, "Oh, Aaron, yeah, we got it for him." Ooh. The bachelor party we all pulled together. I think we put in like sixty five dollars a pop, yeah. and so he opened up this giant Millennium yes. Falcon. I bet he was and amazed. He was just like That's you could incredible. see on his face. He was just like, "I." 
I don't know how to react to this. Yeah. I didn't expect this at all. So mm. it was great. So, um, yes, there's definitely still an opportunity for like, so I mean, that's a, that's sort of a, like an encouragement for people who do this kind of shopping, like put mm. something ridiculous on your wish list. I always do. Yeah. And I tell others to do it too with baby mm-hmm. registries or yep. like marriage registries. Like, yes, put that yeah. stupid thing on the Vitamix. It's 350, <laughs> $500, whatever. Like, yeah, put that on yeah, there. Put you it never on. know. You never know. Exactly. Someone yeah. actually wants to give you these things yeah. and loves you enough to spend the money. It's not a burden. Yeah, exactly. Yep. There are pros and cons to this. Again, it does take out that element of surprise. It yeah. does also take out that element of like, it limits the gift giver. Like, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Cause, and, and, and we'll talk about that uh, with some of the other ones. But yeah, so there are pros and cons, but I think it's a pretty good middle ground, especially for people who are not. My, none of, nobody in my family is a, we talk about the love languages. You yeah. know what I mean? One of the love languages, without getting too far into it, one of the love languages, it's quote gift unquote, giving. is gift giving. Mm-hmm. For people who are, that's a low love language for them. Yeah. I think it's a really good strategy. We, we love it in my family. So yep. we've been doing it for years now. Um, another strategy is giving gift cards, being mm-hmm. like, here is a gift card. You go out and have an experience is often mm-hmm. the idea behind gift gift, uh, gift cards. Now, it can be something from Amazon where you go get what you want. Yeah. And that's kind of goes along with the ne- hand in hand with the next one, which is just give me money. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the strategy of just give me money. I'll just take cash. <laughs> just take cash. Exactly. Mm-hmm. In both cases, it's like you, you buy what you want. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to give you something and then you can be the determiner. Again, right. there's pros and cons. The pros are like, sweet. <laughs> thank you cash ca- i will I'll be happy to take cash or gift cards mm. the downside is like there is that lack of personal touch that lack of oh they were thinking me. about me and they were yeah they were they were trying to yeah but right. like if someone were to be like hey for christmas i paid off one of your credit cards um, like yes yeah, yeah thank That's you amazing. holy crap is amazing yeah, yeah so there is there there can still be a personal touch with that but like it is sort of seen as the sort of quote cop out it can yeah. be depending on your social group and your social standing if you will that can be a that can be seen as a faux pas. That's what's crazy about all these strategies is they have so many social implications to them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because I if I want something extremely expensive and I ask for cash from everyone in my life to put towards this extremely expensive thing that I feel one the societal pressure of feeling embarrassed to ask for yep. something ridiculously expensive. Yeah. Who wants to buy me a $500 video game console? No one. <laughs> yeah, no, right? exactly. And I feel like a moron even asking for it. Yeah. I feel like a moron burdening my family with Or you feel like you have to give them something that. in return. So it's more like, hey, why don't I put together a show and with a cover charge of five bucks a pop and then hope that enough people show that I can get an Xbox. But right, yeah. You, you would think that like, why don't I do that for actual like bills that I need to pay? You know what I mean? Yeah, so and there's, there's all this like questions about it. So and then you kind of sneak under the radar that the, the pro of this would be ask for cash from everyone, mm-hmm. from all family, people who want to give you anything, just be like what do you want cash and then you can spend that on whatever you want yeah and so the pro is you can kind of go under the radar and get what you want without having that societal but i want to highlight this weird social like yeah. you talked about how some people can come across as lavish some people judge others for being mm-hmm. too lavish some people judge others for being too frugal some and, and there's all this like this expectation and this judgment and these like social pressures on all of the strategies we've employed and all the strategies are a result of those different types of pressures. Right. It really is a, it really is a like, Hey, why don't you do like, you need to talk about the talk to the people in your life and figure out what they want to do. You know yeah. what I mean? Because there is like, you could have the truest, purest intentions of the world and you'd be like, Hey, I had a great year. I got a big old Christmas bonus for my check. I want to take that bonus and love all the people in my life in the form of buying them stuff that right. they have talked to me about and said they need and mm-hmm. want. You could go do that, and then you could alienate every single one of those people, right? Because they perceive it a certain way. You know yeah. what I mean? Oh, look at him throwing his money around. So it's so exactly it's yeah. so hard to like. Ooh, big wig over here had a big Christmas bonus yeah. from his big company. So it is a very like there is so much societal yeah. like, back and forth. But that comes down to my last point here, which yep. is there is a. There is a gift giving strategy, which is what I would call true generosity. Yeah. So let's talk about it. What is true generosity? So we're going to make that as our last question. We're going to spend 10 or so minutes talking about true yeah. generosity. What is it? <laughs> and why is it important to reflect on? Have you on? looked this up before we I ask have the not. question? Okay. So, so part of this is my understanding of generosity based on my life experience and based mm-hmm. on my life ambitions. I think true generosity ultimately boils down to one idea, and that is money does not own me. Mm-hmm. Does it make sense? So the idea is like, I am not ruled by my money. Money is not master over me. Therefore, I'm willing to take my money and enrich the lives of others around me. I think that is the true heart of generosity is saying mm-hmm. the people in my life matter more to me than my financial well-being mm-hmm. or whatever. So I'm willing to generate wealth in order to share that wealth with others from a mm-hmm. place of true 
like uh, uh, altruism, if you will. Mm. So because there is also the idea of like, oh, I'm going to be altruistic just to show off. Mm. But I think that true generosity would be saying like, no, what uh, actually the money doesn't matter to me at all. So like I said earlier, true generosity would be someone coming to you and being like, man, I'm just really struggling. I've got this credit card debt that I just can't like I, if I could just pay off this one credit card that would just make like make everything. I'd be able to pull everything together. And then you being able to be like, how much? Write right. a check. You know what I mean? Like in that moment, like, like no strings attached. No, I need you to do this, 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 and this for me. Mm-hmm. It's just truly like, I just want to make your life better and easier because I've been blessed. Mm-hmm. That is, I think, true generosity and being able to have that other person receive that and be like, thank you. Like, <laughs> mm-hmm. this shows you care about me and that's all that matters. Right. Not trying to pay you back. None of that. Right. Just no strings attached. Exactly. Yeah. That exchange of generosity, that economy, if you will, of generosity mm-hmm. is. I think what I would define as quote true generosity. That's my understanding to, of it. To take that one level farther, mm-hmm. a person who has managed their finances in such a way yes. that they have allocated funds for that and uh, like cared for their family, took care of their own needs, diminished their own needs. Mm-hmm. That's there's the two aspects here. There's self sacrifice. Mm-hmm. I am giving up any of my comforts. I'm mm-hmm. ref- I don't go out to eat as much as others because that's fun. I don't have to do mm-hmm. dishes. I don't have to clean up. Someone serves me. I'm not going to do that. We're going to cook. We're going to go through the labor of, I'm going to make that happen and not eat out. Like that's just Mm -hmm. one avenue, right? So they've orchestrated their life. We don't buy things for ourselves. We don't have expensive cars. We don't have a big house. Like we have allocated our entire life to giving. And so you could take someone with a really big salary that lives and they're driving a 95 Civic mm-hmm. with 300,000 miles on it. And they have a kind of rundown house that has a lot of repair needs, but they just kind of put them off and only take care of the ones that really matter. And just like, I'm not really worried about having a nice house, but they give crazy. Yes. That's like, I think that is like amazing. Yeah. But, that's but what the I, that's epitome what I of that love. or that's... like the heart of it is the self-sacrificing part of exactly. it. So I think if true, true generosity is something that really stings, something that you you are really giving up something mm-hmm. you need or, or you think you need or that you love, you're dying to that mm-hmm. for someone else's gain. Yes. You are. You've hit the nail on the head. Sacrifice is the heart, the beating core mm-hmm. of generosity. And it, like you said, it's, you're still, there's the term living within your means. The idea of being like, you know what? You may make hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year mm-hmm. but you live as if you only make ninety thousand and that additional sixty thousand dollars goes towards just lavishing on other people right and that could be in the form of giving to a charity mm-hmm. it could be in the form of giving to like saving some of that money to just help your friends when they say they have a need can yep. you imagine just having a bank account that's set aside for just someone comes up to you and says my car broke down being like how much are the how much are the repairs boom right. that's generosity in my mm-hmm. mind and that's what I, that's personally. Our church does that. Yeah. We, we have, have a, a, a mercy, mercy fund. Yep, yeah. We have a mercy fund that's set aside. It's not tied to the budget at all. Mm-hmm. And the deacons manage it and they dish out all of the money. You know, they're the ones that manage and interact with everyone mm-hmm. and handle it and deal with it fairly. Yeah. The, the, the biggest lesson I learned about generosity. And again, this is something that like I can talk about the ideals of it and I still wrestle with this. Everybody mm-hmm. does. I think everybody should wrestle with this. If you don't wrestle with this mm-hmm. again, the opposite of generosity in this case would be greed. Greed being, I'm going to take and keep whatever I can right. for myself and just focus on my needs and wants and desires are more important than everybody else's well-being. That's right. greed, and that's the opposite of generosity. Mm-hmm. For me, the biggest lesson I learned about generosity was when I moved out of the house. Oh, no, no, sorry. I was still living with a couple of guys. Yeah. One of the guys just completely reneged on like our deal. He basically like he lived with us for a while and then he just gave us like five days notice, moved out. Yeah. And we were like, you can't do that. You have to give us at least 30 days. Mm. But we hadn't had anything in writing. So there was a questionability of like who owed. So he wanted a security deposit back. So there was questionability about who owed whom what. Like, mm-hmm. do we owe you a security deposit when you just leave on us in five days? I felt in the right for saying that I don't owe you anything. Right. I ended up like he he fought tooth and nail. We we fought about it, and I ended up saying, you know what? I'll give you the money out of my own pocket because uh, clearly it means more to you than it means to me. I was mad. I was angry. I felt entitled, but I said, you know what? My money and my finances don't matter more to me than your well being. Because even though we fought, even though we didn't get along, even though we're mm-hmm. still not really friends to this day, I looked at him and I said, you know what? <laughs> your success matters more to me than. Than this amount of money. Mm-hmm. So I said, here you go. Here's a check. It was hard. I'm not saying, I'm not trying to present this as if like, oh, Penguin's so awesome. Mm-hmm. It's just a lesson that I had to learn the hard way of yeah. like, you know what? Like, just because I feel like I'm right on this doesn't mean that it's worth, me being right is not worth this amount of money. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to give it to him. 
Yeah. So it was hard, and I didn't I didn't love it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm not thrilled about it. Do I kind of feel cheated? Could he possibly have cheated me? Probably. Some people might be like, oh, Penguin, you just got swindled. But like, whatever. Like, so what if I got swindled? And that's kind of the heart. You know what I mean? Like, not questioning other people's intention. If someone, if you buy groceries for someone mm-hmm. in, in the line in front of you because there's, they don't know if they can pay it, maybe they conned you, but maybe. does it matter? Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, because, you know, sure, you may have lost 40 bucks, but like, and so you may have gotten, quote, swindled out of 40 bucks. But on the other hand, you may have just made someone's week. Maybe. You may have just yeah. fed their kids mm-hmm. for a week. You know what I mean? Or you just gave them a bottle of liquor. But who cares? You know what I mean? <laughs> but like, but why question that? Right. Why not let the effect of generosity mm-hmm. on your heart? Who cares about the outcomes? It's, 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 it really is like, who cares about the ends right. when the means are what's important? When the means are what make you a better, like what transform your heart and mind? Mm. That's what I think is generosity. So. Mm. Yeah. So why is this important? Why do we talk about this in a gaming podcast? <laughs> <laughs> Well, the video game industry is ridden with charities, uh, yeah. and I went through and made a bunch of notes, and we're going to have to like call some of these down. Yeah, but uh, it goes back to our our previous conversation about video game companies. The industry exists because capitalism. Yeah, they, Every, they everyone exist wants to make money, money yep. right? And so, so greed is an inherent part of that, kind of, and a side effect. There's, of that. it's not just greed though, because these people could make money to then give it out on their own, sure. and, or not. It's kind of an individual thing. So the idea is, we're going to establish a company, and we're going to employ people, which allows them to make money to feed their families. You know, and life goes on. Like that's kind of the lifeblood, the heartbeat, if you will, of industry in America. It that's what they are. So if if a company is super generous. Beyond their means, the company collapses, people yep. get laid off, and yep. there's no benefit to anyone. Like, that's just detrimental and dangerous. So, there are benefits to capitalism that are, so I don't want to separate, you know, super generous companies or companies should be more generous when we don't really know, like, the generosity of a company should exist within the constraints of that company, of what they can handle to stay yeah. alive, to stay viable, to stay profitable, because mm. that's what a company should be. Because a profitable company is, in and of itself, kind of generous to its employees just by existing in a way that makes giving money. Giving them jobs, exactly. Right, yeah. And giving them jobs and benefits, etc. So, having laid that foundation, uh, you had the question about, like, could greater generosity transform the gaming industry and culture? And that question, the way that it's written, implies that there is a need for more generosity. And my immediate reaction was, look at the generosity that's already there. Sure. And I've yeah, highlighted some of the things in the gaming culture that are super generous, that the not just the companies themselves, the developers and the publishers, et cetera, but the gamers themselves mm-hmm. are. Yeah. And so like running through some of the, the big charities that make a ton of money and do a lot of great things, most recently we just had the Extra Life. Extra Life focuses on raising money for hospitals in the Children's Miracle Network. Players collect donations in support of a day of gaming, with, as many, with, with many aiming to complete a full 24-hour marathon of playtime. So the idea mm-hmm. is to, to stream, live stream, 24 hours straight of playing video games to get tips and people coming in to donate money. And all that money goes to children's the ch- children's Miracle Network. So to me, that is a, a gaming culture thing. You know, it's the gamers doing it, not really a company. But, you know, the gamers are doing that. So that's really cool. Yeah, no, and sure. then you have Games Done Quick, which we've talked about on the show before, where we have a bunch of speedrunners that live stream uh, for an entire week, 24 seven streams. It never breaks. It never stops. It's just game after game after game after game. And they collect a ton of money that goes to different charities each year. Uh, then we have the able gamers foundation, which could be arguably the most generous thing because this puts the focus on, uh, using video games to improve the quality of life for people with disabilities. Yeah. So it goes mm-hmm. beyond just the monetary like aspect of, of being generous it encourages accessibility in games and provides outreach and education for the subject. It also works with developers and studios to help their creations be inclusive to all players, regardless of any differing abilities in mobility, hearing, vision, or cognition. Well, so, that's that's what the game Xbox Adaptive Controller is exactly, all about. Exactly, so, right? Yeah, that, was, that's incre- that is what I would describe as incredibly generous of Microsoft. They didn't yeah, have to do that. Right. They chose to. Mm-hmm. Sure, they might make money off of it. They will. But they also 
Like, right. it's still That's generous. That's a perfect example change. of generosity existing in the, within the constraints of a company. And generosity right? should be rewarded. And in a lot of ways, like, we should be buying the games of companies that are being generous right. and are, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, we should be, we should absolutely be supporting and rewarding the companies that are generous. Yeah. But, yeah, go on. And then the last one I want to talk about is the Humble Bundle. Humble Bundle. Which uh, is a great avenue for video game companies to sell their games at a steep discount for charity. And so this is where the game companies, like the actual developers and, and publishers, can get involved because they're taking a huge cut in their profit by just selling a game at a super big discount. The digital store sells games at a pay-what-you-want model for every purchase, and then 10% of that goes to charity. The Humble Team, the people who put this organization together, makes it very easy for uh, philanthropic gamers to direct their funds with options to select one of the many organizations that they are part of. So you can like select which ones or assign different percentages to each group. So that allows the buyer to like have say of where their yeah. money goes. But that's I highlighted that uh, uh, these for a couple examples. One, some of them are gamer culture focused. Yeah, and that's like Extra Life or the Games Done Quick, where it's gamers doing it, not developers. And then there's the Humble Bundle, which developers and publishers get involved, where they're willing to not get a profit on these set of games, sell them at a super dis- discount for charities. Yeah, and so that's all crazy good generosity happening in the gaming industry. Yes, and I'm glad, this is part of the reason why I'm glad I do a podcast with you is because you are the balancing aspect for me because I I wrote that question, you're right, I wrote that question with a certain intention mm. and you subverted that attention by saying, why don't we actually highlight the generosity yeah. that already exists within the gaming culture? So kudos to you, bravo. You're welcome. I'm, I am I thank you for doing that. There can still be more generosity and mm-hmm. I still I still look at the gaming industry today and I really feel like the last decade has been defined. You know, can you... I think everybody should ask themselves, and I'm going to be quick on this response because we've got things to do yep. <laughs> in five minutes. Yep. It's easy to look. I think everybody should ask themselves the question, am I being greedy or am I being generous by this decision? Sometimes it is actually okay to be just admit that you're being greedy. We should have grace on ourselves for being like, I'm being greedy in this moment. I need this for self-care or whatever. Mm-hmm. But we should still overall look and say, is this generosity or is this greed? And despite all the examples you've listed, I've looked at the last 10 years of gaming, and I can't help but say this decade has been defined more by greed from the gaming industry than generosity. You think so? I do. Okay. So I think that there are ways that I think the gaming industry could be transformed by generosity. And it all boils down to the fact that, like, most of the money is still going into the hands of the shareholders at the end Mm -hmm. of the day. And so companies can be more generous by... Again, I'm not sitting there saying that they should just give <laughs> give out games or for free or anything like that. That's silly and that's mm-hmm. pointless generosity. Because like you said, there's an economy and a balancing act to generosity. You need to still be able to do, generate wealth to give it away. Right. That's the sweet spot of being able to be like, I'm good. I've got all my needs taken care of. Here's mm-hmm. generosity. Right. I think more generosity can be given to developers. The actual artists, the people creating games, raise those paychecks, up those paychecks. The people mm-hmm. who are actually making and creating the art should be rewarded for that. Mm-hmm. We'd see better games as a result of it. The 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 consumer could only benefit from that. Mm-hmm. I think generosity can come in the form of developers and publishers listening to what gamers want. You know, we don't want, we've made it clear, we don't want these greedy microtransactions and games as a service-y monetization strategies that are predatory. We don't want that. Listen and, to us. And it's thus generous you have, to remove that. You have Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. Exactly. Yeah. Which is exactly. a completely single player game by EA without a single microtransaction. And just because things are changing in the last yeah, they are. few years of the decade doesn't yeah. mean that right. the last decade still didn't happen. You know yeah. what I mean? Doesn't Jedi mistakes. Fallen Order's existence does yeah. not negate sure. Battlefront's existence, yeah. Battlefront 2's existence. Mm. So But it um, is indicative of, of them doing just change. that. Yeah. Listening. Yeah. So yeah. there's a lot of, you know, reducing what we talked about before, crunch time mm-hmm. would be incredibly generous. Being able to say as a publisher, we are delaying this game so that the health of our developers is looked after mm-hmm. would be an incredibly generous decision. Last of Us was delayed. Animal Crossing was delayed. Again, you're giving examples. Doom Eternal was delayed. You're giving exceptions. The end of our decade. Yes. Yeah. But again, we've the, seen the this decade happen was like, over and over to games yeah. that we love and have bought. Mm-hmm. So I'm just saying that like, I want to see more of that. 
you're right in highlighting it's that it's happening. Yeah. I want to see more, 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 more generosity from yeah. these publishers. The decade that we've, we're going to actually going to have an entire episode coming up on New Year's Eve about the decade, right? We're doing yeah. that, the whole mm-hmm. 2010s and it's going to be fun to talk about it because we have both set up, failed and reacted to <laughs> yeah. it all in the same decade yeah, for everything we years, just talked about. Yeah. And now we're seeing the very end of this decade mm-hmm. closing out with, yeah. with the changes we want. Yeah. And I agree with you. We want more of that. Yep. Uh, I actually have on the notes how a, uh, a companies, video game developers and publishers can be generous both internally with their employees and the benefits of it, like you had alluded to, if a company is internally generous to its employees and its constituents, then you have higher morale, Yep. which means greater creativity. Yep. You have a more stable employee base, as in less turnaround. So mm-hmm. you people like fewer people leaving, yep. you know, so you have the same core group of people. And then if you invest in those people with, with career training and education and like guidance within their company, you have higher talent being retained yeah. and you're growing what you have. And then generosity you can, has bigger long-term right. returns. Yeah. And you yeah. can have a way, Always. way Thank higher great. creativity and way yep. quality, better quality games I coming out of, agree. out of your studio. Yeah. If you do that. Yep. Well, cool. That's our conversation on generosity. It we is. just have to wrap things up because it's getting very close to us having to start yep. our live tweeting. But so hopefully you don't feel like we've cut this conversation short. We've gone about like five or so more minutes than we usually go. So yep. um, we want to hear your thoughts. What are your thoughts on gift giving? What are strategies that you've used and you use in your family for gift giving? Mm-hmm. Uh, and what are uh, what are your thoughts on generosity? The idea of like being generous and generating wealth for the purpose of giving it to others. I would love to hear from people who are scared to talk because they think they're greedy mm-hmm. i want to hear from you guys sure. like, i yeah. want to know what are like, your perspectives on yeah this? because yeah. it would be so refreshing as a society to kind of remove the stigma from oh i'm going to be perceived as greedy and like you said extend grace to one another yeah and like if you're a greedy person just say it like yep. let's talk about that yep and, for sure and i think it's totally okay yep. so uh you can find us on discord that's our number one place to find us it's our easiest barrier of entry there's a link to our discord server in every one of our show notes on uh, social media platforms you can find us at anybitpodsmash.com. That's where we have a landing site with links to Google Play, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, and Spotify. And if you would like to interact with us on those social media platforms, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Reddit, Twitter. I think that's it. Cool. <laughs> Discord? Did you talk about Discord? I did. That was the first thing I said. Nice. Uh, so our, our tags on all of those things are 80BIT Podsmash. No hyphens, no uppercases, no funny business. Tag us on Twitter. Follow us on Facebook. Follow us on Instagram and subscribe to our subreddit where you can create your own threads for conversation. Sweet. We next week we because of the weirdness of where the day lands that this launches, we will not be doing our gaming by the decade in review. We're going to save that for after New Year's when it's okay. technically the new year. Yep. So in bet- the between weeks, we're still going to be running with the sole idea of Christmas and the sort of religious aspect of the time that we're in. Yeah. A lot of time when people reflect on religion, whether they believe it or not. And we're going to talk about fictional religions in video games. Yeah, so look next. for that. So, you know. To close out 2019, we're going to talk about fictional religions. Fictional religions. It'll be fun. Exactly. It should be fun. Yep. yep. So that's our episode. Have a Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas. See you next week. Bye.